There are three things that your brain must sense to inhibit or relax overactive psoas muscles. You need to sense your heels, your molars, and peripheral vision, particularly on the left side. To understand this, you have to keep in mind that the psoas muscle does not operate independently, so stretching it does not make a lot of sense from a brain perspective. The brain won't understand what you're trying to do with that psoas muscle. The psoas is embedded in three larger systems, your respiratory system, your ability to diaphragmatically breathe, and remember, as I'm going to show, the right diaphragm and the left diaphragm are very different. The psoas muscle cannot be separated from the diaphragm, as you can see in this picture. Number two, it's embedded in the motor movement system. The psoas muscle externally rotates the left leg, but it also uh, rotates the lumbar spine in the opposite direction as you swing that leg forward. It's also embedded in a postural reflex system, part of the vestibular system, where your brain is integrating sensory input from the visual world and from the ground, your inner ear, and then your sense of your body, where your body is in space, and also the sense of your own body internally. I'm going to show some videos about how I, when I manipulate someone's sensory input through their left heel, their left molars, and their left peripheral vision, how that will immediately inhibit overactive psoas muscle and just say hip flexors on that left side. Why am I focusing on the left side? Because of this picture. Your left diaphragm and your right diaphragm are not the same size. So although your pelvis and the pelvis musculature, like the iliacus, the QL muscle, the psoas muscle, and the pelvic diaphragm, they may look symmetrical, and they are, but on top of that is a respiratory system with a bigger right diaphragm, so it would be on this side, which conspires to pull your pelvis forward on the left. This shifts our weight over to the right side. This is in posture restoration. This is called the left AIC pattern. Humans are not symmetrical, not even close. The left side and the right side of our body and our brain, while overlapping, they are not the same and they don't function exactly in the same way, particularly in the body. In my anatomy program, it draws or renders the body symmetrically. But, and that's what you see on the left side. But on the right, on the, the picture on the right, what you see is the bigger circles, the bigger green circles are on the right side. That is because our brain, because of that bigger right diaphragm and the postural responsibilities of the left hemisphere of the brain, which make 90% of the world right hand dominant, right eye dominant, normal lateralization is right ear, right eye, right arm, right hand, and I'll say right molar and right heel. That's what, that's what happens if you're on your right side. Now this is my right side, so for you it would be this way. On that right side, that's what you're going to get. So the brain is sensing those structures more on the right than on the left. That is the underlying neurology of this whole system. And because of that, the left pelvis tends to like to come forward into hip, into hip flexion, which keeps the left psoas overactive. Now you could say my, my right psoas or my right hip flexors are overactive. That's fine, and they can be, but they're not going to be for this reason. At any rate, you can't deal with right hip flexor overactivity if you're stuck on your right side. You have to get onto your left side first and then deal with why the right psoas is overactive and as a hint, or the right hip flexors, and as a hint, it's usually because you lost your right glute. Although I'm showing videos of how I can inhibit or turn off an overactive left psoas muscle, just by manipulating sensory input, at the end of the video, I'm going to show you a typical Postural Restoration Institute technique that is designed to inhibit that left, those left hip flexors, the left psoas and left, the left rectus femoris, by using a left hamstring, but not through, you can't think of it as a gym exercise, it's through a neurosensory technique that allows your brain to understand how to turn on a left hamstring so that can shut off an overactive left psoas muscle. So the first video you're going to see is how I manipulate this individual's left heel sense. He came from the UK with his brother to see me. He, he wasn't in pain, his brother was. He has no clue about posture restoration. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know anything about this. He had no clue that he was in the same pattern that his brother is. So I'm just going to show you his testing. And he's going to fail the adduction drop test, which is going to indicate a pelvis that is forward on the left side. His left leg will not go down because his, his pelvis is stuck forward. He has an overactive hip flexor or psoas, 
I check his neck, and I'm just putting a little heel cup around his left heel, and he says he felt it. So I'm going to lie him down again. He didn't even get up, didn't walk around, but he felt the left heel cup, and now he can adduct. He's laughing because he's like, what is this? All right, so he had no clue about anything. So just giving his brain sense of his left heel inhibited his left hip flexors immediately. If you find this video interesting, could you like it, share it, subscribe, or leave a nice comment? Thanks. Now the next video is why you need left molars, why molars, particularly on the left side, are so darn important for this whole stability system, this whole movement system to function properly. This individual doesn't have left molars. She was, they never came in when she was born or when, they, when her primary teeth fell out, they were never replaced. So she doesn't have any molars on the left side. And I'm pretty sure it's the first molar or the second molar or both, I can't remember now. But uh, you'll see, again, she's gonna fail the adduction test, which means her left side of her pelvis will be forward. She's shifted over to her right side. Now I just have her chew gum with her left side. And then you can see she can now adduct. Her hip flexors shut off the moment she started to sense something over on the left side that she wasn't sensing on the right. Her issue is that she has more right, she has more teeth on her right side than her left. So that already right dominant, that already do, right dominant system where the left side comes forward and they're shifted over to the right side, which is called the left AIC pattern in posture restoration. Uh, she's already over sensing this on steroids. So if you look at this diagram again, those, the occlusal forces up in the cranium on the right side are way bigger than the occlusal forces on their left side. Uh, so she's going to have, a, she's going to struggle. She probably needs implants uh, to replace that left molar to give her balanced sense. Otherwise she's never going to be able to stay out of that pattern because the moment she taps her teeth together and is not chewing, she goes right back into the pattern. I like this diagram because I don't even remember where I found it. I think it was in this polarity book, but which is very much based off of cranial sacral therapy and osteopathic medicine, who are doctors, they're osteopaths, they are, they're normal doctors, they just do extra schooling about the cranium. And they make the comparison between how the cranium moves the temporal bones of the TMJ and the pelvis, that's what you're seeing there. That's, that's the connection. So uh, they, they work in the same exact way, they're connected from head to toe, you're all connected, it's all connected, and there you go. And remember, at the end of the video, I'm going to show you a postural restoration technique that can be used to accomplish this same thing, but it will be more effective because you're actually using your own muscles to, uh, to change things. Now, quite often when you find an overactive left psoas and left hip flexors, you're also going to find an overactive right neck. They're kind of neurologically paired. So when this is what you're going to see quite often. It's going to be the same thing. Her neck is going to have limited range of motion because of the, the lack of left molars. And that's what you're going to see here. I change in here. So when I side bend her neck to the right, it doesn't really go far. But now when she puts a tongue depressor between her left molars, her neck side bends much more to the right side. This is normal in postural restoration world. It might not be normal in the rest of the world, who are unaware of all these connections, but neurologically, uh, this is what's normal in postural restoration. Remember, postural restoration is, as if you're familiar with it, it's much less. It's much less about biomechanics. It's based. It's really about how biomechanics are influenced by neurosensory input, by what the brain is sensing, is giving you posture. So what you look like when you're standing is based off of how your brain is perceiving sensory input. And if you don't have left molars. Your neck is going to stay overactive, your hip flexors may stay overactive, and it's going to be very difficult for you to find the ground underneath that left side. So even if you have good sneakers and good left heel sense, well, you won't have good left heel sense because the cranium will always overrule anything that's going on beneath the cranium. Now the next one is visual, and this individual has uh, a high astigmatism in his left eye, and it's like, it's maybe a 1.75, but only 0.5, I think, on the right. So I was already suspicious when I saw that prescription. But he had two different pairs of glasses, one with astigmatism correction and one without. So you're going to see the difference. So here, just make note. How does that feel? Just make note. Tight. Tight. OK. It's tight. And then it's tight. Do you feel your left hip at all when I do this? Yes. That's what feels like it's restricting. Okay. He feels his hip flexors overactive. All right, so now he's going to change the glasses. 
does that feel? Much looser. Mm. Much looser. Yeah, it feels great. Yeah. Any tension? No. It's much no, less. No. The hip flexor tension. Much less tension. Yeah. All right. So he said all the tension's gone. So his left leg, internal rotation and external rotation, were limited because of the, not because of his vision per se, but because the prescription, one of the, one of the pairs of glasses that he has, has the astigmatism correction, and it's most likely making his left eye hyperfocus. And when the left eye hyperfocuses or has too much clarity, you stop processing left peripheral vision. So if you don't have left heel sense, left molar sense, and a visual system that is, that is sensing and processing the periphery rather than just what's right in front of you, you can't shift to the left effectively and you're gonna stay in this left AIC pattern shifted over to your right side. That was being driven by his visual system. His teeth were fine, his shoes were fine. The moment he put on the pair of glasses that didn't have the astigmatism correction, his entire body relaxed he could actually do PRI techniques and feel everything properly, but if he had the glasses with the astigmatism correction that was making his left eye too focused, right, and thus dropping off left periphery, he couldn't even shift his left hip back. He literally could not do, he couldn't bring his left hip back, which is required to turn your body over to the left side. Couldn't even do it. He, he could tell when he was trying to do techniques, he couldn't get that hip flexor, the, the psoas, to shut off. That was visually driven. That had nothing to do with the hip flexor itself or the psoas itself. That was the sense, all of those videos, was a overactive left psoas and hip flexors due to sensory processing, to a brain that was over-processing things on the right and not processing enough things on the left. And again, that's inherent inside of us. Not really an issue as long as we keep our bodies moving and in good shape. But when we sit too much and we start to get injuries and we just, modern life makes our normal asymmetry uh, a problem and we become too right dominant. And that's really the, the underlying issue. Now this technique is called the 90-90 hip lift with right arm reach and balloon. It does not have a hip shift. So you're not going to be shifting your left hip back like a lot of PRI techniques do. And the reason I'm doing that is the reason I'm doing this version is because you're just going to lift your butt up. You're just going to pick up your hips, sense your left heel. You're going to be pulling your left heel down, sensing the arch of your right foot, no hip shift. A lot of people can't hip shift because if you're in significant amounts of pain, what's going to happen is you're probably uh, unstable through that pelvis. And a lot of unstable people, the moment they try to hip shift, they're left lower back or their back in general will start to tighten up on them or they'll even maybe feel it in their neck they might feel the right abdominal wall the right side. something's going to get tightened up on them or maybe cramp or just make you feel not so great that's why hip shift and a lot of people can't hip shift right away so if you do pri techniques i never tell people to start with hip shifts because they might not be ready for it but it's very individual so i'm just showing this one either way it will result in the same thing uh, if you do it correctly and you have nothing going on with vision or jaw and teeth, it will probably work. So what happens? So I'm gonna just show you how it's done. And uh, you're gonna see that I'm lying on the ground and I pick my butt up. There's a ball between my knees. I squeeze the ball with my left knee only. I'm pulling my left heel down towards the floor. I'm sensing the arch of my right foot and I'm gonna blow up the balloon. And I, as I exhale, I reach my right arm forward. Then I pause for five sec, well, three to five seconds. And then I inhale again and I blow into the balloon. I pause for three to five seconds. Keep sensing your left heel. Keep sensing the arch of your right foot. You should feel your left hamstring and your left inner thigh. And you might have to replay that a couple times because there's a lot going on. This is what it looks like from a different angle. I pick my butt up. I start to pull my heel, my left heel into the back of the shoe. Like I'm pulling down, like I'm doing a leg curl. Inhale through my nose, blow into the balloon, reach with my right arm. As I reach that right arm forward, it turns my lumbar spine to the left through the right lower trap muscle. Notice my head is staying down. You can see my body turning further to the left. I'm feeling my left lower and mid back staying flat on the floor. And that is a very typical PRI technique that is used um, a lot. So I start a lot of people with that technique 
And let me just show you how easily these tests can change because I'm not showing tests with that video, but just watch this video. And this individual will have both sides of his pelvis forward. So his right leg does not go down. So his right hip flexors are overactive also. And his left leg will not go down. It's worse, obviously, because the left side is always going to be worse. His left shoulder will not internally rotate. So I know his rib cage is flared up on both sides. He's overarched. He's extended. And his right shoulder will not internally rotate. So now I'm going to teach him how to blow up a balloon. And I put him in the right position. He senses his left sit bone. He blows once. I've already made a video with this. He can adduct his right leg. He can adduct his left leg. His pelvis is, so he can adduct. His hip flexors are off. And he now has the ability to internally rotate both of his shoulders. And he's good to go at that point. His body is now in a neutral state. He's no longer in this uh, left AIC PEC pattern. And how did that change so quickly? Because all we were doing was changing his brain's sense of his body. We were, that was a diaphragm technique. They're all diaphragm techniques. The only difference between sitting on a box and lying on your back is the position. They're the same position. Hips and knees are bent at 90 degrees. For him, because for a variety of reasons, I started him in that position. Not every technique is, is, works for every single person. That's what people have to understand. It's highly individual. How did, he, how did those tests change so quickly? Because you changed his brain's processing about how to breathe, and the whole system just relaxed. All psychologists know to get people to be more relaxed, they have to diaphragmatically breathe. The problem is most psychologists don't know that when people walk into their office, they're stuck in a position which does not allow them to diaphragmatically breathe. So PRI techniques put you in a position so that you can diaphragmatically breathe, and then you bias the left side because the left side has that smaller left diaphragm. So when he was sitting, so either the 90-90, when I'm sensing my left heel and right arch, those two areas of the feet are associated with being on your left side. Hence, you can use your left diaphragm. Sensorily, that won't happen if you put your awareness on your left toes. You'll completely lose it. Or your right heel. It's not going to work the same way. You're not going to change those tests because that's just going to put you back on your right side. Uh, so in the seated position, I had him blowing up the balloon with his back rounded, sensing his left heel and his left sit bone and it got him neutral. So it's really the same outcome. I just, the techniques are different for different people because not everybody's the same. And uh, that's how that works.